So, yeah, today I'm going to be speaking about uh, my ongoing work relating to the growth regime of um, what I call commercialized states, borrowing a term from Ronan Palin. Essentially, these are the states that include uh, export platforms and tax havens that use different dimensions of economic or government policy to, to try to appease and attract um, foreign multinationals in particular, but you could broaden it um, to foreign capitalists or foreign capital. But here I'm going to be looking at quite specifically at foreign multinationals. Okay, so two key terms that I would like to uh, kind of clarify. Um, first, neoliberal globalization. Well, we all have a sort of vague, or we all, I guess in this group we would have a good idea of what this is, but um, just to be very concrete, I would like to um, include uh, Pali's notion here of barge economics and the sort of differentiating factor uh, between neoliberal globalization and previous ways of globalization. And by barge economics uh, or the barge economy, Pali says um, that globalized, these are essentially related to these globalized production networks um, with multinational enterprises at the helm that are configured on the principle of global cost arbitrage. Um, Pali continues, where it, as, it, as, it is as if, I think there's an is missing there, uh, factories are placed on barges that float between countries to take advantage of lowest costs, which can be due to undervalued exchange rates, low taxes, subsidies, absence of regulation, abundant cheap and exploitable labor. So this is a key differentiating factor. We can see this in the empirics, uh, insofar as uh, if we look at exports, global exports, um, or exports around the globe as a percentage of GDP, or global GDP, this uh, rises rather steadily, rather linearly, but it's the FDI um, over GDP ratio, which really shoots up in recent decades and the global profits of multinationals around the world that uh, shoot up in around the 90s. So this is the differentiating factor, differentiating factor that we can see. This, in my opinion, is, I guess that's of others, is very closely related to what Ronan Palin describes as the commercialization of state sovereignty. Um, he uses this term to describe tax havens, but he also notes that um, special economic zones and flags convenience are the same sort of thing, or he quotes Oppenheimer saying that. Um, so what is this same sort of thing? What is this commercialization of state sovereignty? Well, essentially, it regards the um, policy competition that uh, is engaged in um, between states, between policymakers in different states, and it's fought along the dimensions of tax, tariffs and duties, subsidies, rents on public land, labor costs, regulation in various forms, whether it be worker rights, environmental protection, other kinds of um, bureaucratic costs that the government can impose, um, as seen from the business side. And then the provision of uh, various infrastructural projects and direct government assistance directly to these foreign multinationals to try and aid their uh, presence or their production process. And all of this is done in order to attract or retain foreign capital and or production processes. So Palin isn't exactly um, very specific with what he means by commercialization of state sovereignty, but this is essentially what we can say that he's referring to. Now, um, the first sort of um, central claim here is that Palin's commercialization of state sovereignty is deeply related to Pali's barge economics. We have the technological and regulatory changes that we see in the form of lower transportation costs, lower tariffs, um, and this allows the growth in size and number of multinationals, which leads to this barge economics phenomenon. And the sort of recognition um, of the barge economics logic by policymakers changes the way they conduct um, policymaking and lawmaking. They start to cooperate uh, with multinationals and try to align their interest with those of the state, uh, with those of the multinationals. Um, and in doing so, they start competing with other countries to make itself the destination for foreign capital, whether that be financial in the case of in, in the case of tax havens or tangible in the case of export platforms. So the evidence for commercialization of state sovereignty can be seen perhaps most clearly in two phenomena. The first of which being um, the falling corporate tax rates seen around the world, the race to the bottom. Here we have the OECD statutory average rates, the top line here, and you can see it really starts to fall since the 80s. Oh, apologies. And we also have the effective rates of tax paid by foreign multinationals of US, uh, foreign affiliates of US multinationals uh, in the dashed line below. And that is halved in the 
period of analysis. The second phenomenon related to the commercialization of state sovereignty is the proliferation of special economic zones around the world. Here we see- Ian, so, sorry to interrupt you. Can you move closer to your microphone? Because ah. at least I cannot always properly hear you. Maybe it's my internet connection. Uh, okay. I also have headphones if that makes things easier. But um, can you hear me better now? It sounds like you're covering your microphone in a way sometimes, I don't know. Huh, okay. Because sometimes it's fine, then sometimes it's very... Um, How strange. Low. Maybe it's because I'm streaming at the same time and I do not know. But I'll, I'll try out the earphones and see if it's any better. Does this sound any better? Yeah, for now, yeah. Yeah? We will see, we'll let you know. Okay, thanks. Um, Okay, so where was I? So with the special economic zones, do let me know if you can't hear me. Um, yeah, we see they have grown in number uh, around the world, and also the number of countries employing them has grown from around 30 to around, um, well, 150. So there are more countries that do employ them than don't. And out of the roughly 5,400 SEZs um, in 2018, around half of them are in China, according to Internet. So that's already um, quite a um, phenomenon in and of itself. So essentially taking these three figures together, we can see that, um, well, this period of neoliberal globalization is defined not only by barge economics seen in uh, the increasing FDI inflows, multinational presence, but also in commercialization of state sovereignty. And it all seems to coincides with the period around the 1990s, there, thereabouts. Okay, so uh, does the sound, does it, is, is the sound okay? No, okay. So what can we say about these commercialized states, these uh, economies that use these um, strategies and how could it lead to growth, if at all? Well, one thing to note is that they are kind of, what they share in common is usually a high trade surplus. What I've done here is take data on from the World Bank on uh, net exports as a percent of GDP um, for virtually every country in the world for the last 10 years or so. And I've excluded oil and uh, precious metal uh, exports in countries and uh, ranked them. And what we're left with is essentially a list of tax havens at the top um, with reference to the literature here. And in green, what I'll call export platforms. Um, now by export platform, there is, I don't think necessarily a universal agreed upon definition, but what I mean is, uh, or I'll take it to mean non-haven economies where 40% of their net exports uh, can be ascribed to foreign owned firms. So if we use this definition, then we have, oh, sorry, 40% or more. So sometimes it's much more. Um, if we use this definition, then we include the likes of Malaysia, Thailand, Hungary, uh, Czechia, uh, Estonia, Sweden, Slovakia, and uh, China. And then we can see that amongst this group, we have the sort of SEZ dependent countries or countries that use SEZs. And then we have the Central and Eastern European countries um, that is, I think, quite well described within the comparative political economy literature. Um, and in, in a sense, I want to kind of bring this in to a post-Keynesian framework uh, in some way. Um, we also have Sweden. I'm also, I'm not exactly sure what to make of, of Sweden. I've tried to do a little bit of research on that and I've failed to fully understand how we can uh, kind of see the relationship of Sweden to these other uh, countries. So that's kind of left outstanding. So if you have any comments on Sweden, I'd be very interested to hear. Um, okay, so we see in general that they tend to have high uh, net export to GDP ratios. This would seem to imply that they could be considered a kind of export-led growth. And in some cases, I think we can say that. But I think we have to be quite careful insofar as the net exports of tax havens, I, I mean, we see that they're generally um, rather massively high. Um, and the question is, well, what's going on here? And essentially it boils down to the fact uh, of how profit shifting um, affects the trade uh, uh, balance of these um, tax havens. Two of the three commonly identified means of profit shifting are known to inflate 
sometimes grossly the net exports of tax havens and deflate them elsewhere. Um, the first means is transfer mispricing. So for example, when an affiliate imports a finished product at cost price or thereabouts say, and exports at market price with little or no value added in the tax haven, then essentially they are able to book those profits in the haven. And then we also have intragroup royalty payments where a multinational caters intellectual property in the haven. So affiliates elsewhere will pay for the service that the IP provides. Um, just to contextualize this, Torslav et al. find that around 40% of global multinational profits were shifted in 2015. And of those shifted profits, around 85%, so the vast majority, occur through these two trade distorting channels. There is a third channel, the interest payment channel. This does not affect trade and it's less prevalent. So we already have a pretty good understanding of why tax havens have such high net export to GDP ratios. Okay, so now how can we understand the growth models of these so-called commercialized states? How do they relate to um, the sort of what I would call a sort of basic trichotomy that we see in the literature of demand, uh, domestic demand-led, debt-led and export-led? Um, well, Bola and Reagan, I think, have quite an interesting take on the growth regime of Ireland and Hungary. Um, they describe it as as these economies as FDI-led, and they describe uh, FDI-led growth models, and apologies for the long text here, but these are growth models um, which are particular cases of export-oriented growth, where the major exporting firms are foreign-owned. Once these firms have sunk their investments in a host country, multinational corporations depend on government policies to support their competitive edge. In this sense, host states and multinational corporations become strategically in interdependent. The bargains uh, re and multinationals reach with host countries typically revolve around capital investment incentives, taxation, labor market flexibility. So these sorts of state, what we have here called state commercialization strategies. So this seems to just fit very nicely into what I'm trying to get out here. So I was quite happy to find this uh, paper recently uh, released. And we can certainly go beyond Ireland and Hungary in this, this particular notion of FDI-led growth and extend it to um, special economic zone dependent countries and other non-haven commercialized states in especially Central and Eastern Europe um, described elsewhere in the CPE literature. Now, two questions come to my mind at this point is, uh, well, the first is, how can we understand this kind of FDI-led growth from a post-Keynesian perspective? Because I would uh, say that we don't quite have a concrete conceptualization of what FDI-led means uh, within post-Keynesian economics. Um, a second question is, uh, can tax havens uh, like Ireland, like, other, uh, like um, Luxembourg and other countries uh, really be considered particular cases of export-oriented growth? if so much of their exports are actually due to um, this profit shifting illusion essentially. And just to kind of contextualize that, that question a bit more, if uh, Torslev et al's uh, estimates can be trusted, then essentially all of Ireland's uh, net exports in 2015 uh, vanish once you correct for profit shifting. Ireland is then seen as a net importer in 2015 for the context of the Torsla et al data. So profit shifting isn't necessarily just a minor distortion. It can in fact be the entire, uh, it can distort it completely the trade balance of certain uh, tax havens in particular. Okay, so this is the, um, yeah, the newest part of the work and something I'm still working on. Uh, so yeah, essentially I'm trying to build a simple model of uh, these different kinds of commercialized states, uh, keeping in mind that there is this high presence of net exports and how we can include that in a model. Um, what I have done here is a very simplified, it's a two period discrete um, model. Everything is expressed in levels. Um, in period one, it's kind of the pre neoliberal globalization periods. There are no foreign affiliates. Uh, this is just a benchmark baseline sort of period to which we will compare uh, period two, which has foreign affiliates. Um, okay, so let's 
this quickly builds the benchmark model economy. Um, it follows quite straightforwardly that there's nothing too controversial here. Consumption is a function of autonomous consumption and uh, uh, disposable income uh, and so on. Um, investment is a, is a function of autonomous investments and uh, some responsiveness to demand, proxy prime income. Here is the one thing that I think deserves more comments. Um, government expenditure is seen as being a function of um, tax revenue times the public budget uh, position. Now, I'm not saying that taxes are needed in order to spend, but what I am saying is that we can model it in such a way where um, government expenditure can be as detached from tax revenues as like, but we'll, we'll just locate that sort of exogenous decision is politically uh, the time of decision within the B parameter, such that if it's uh, the economy is consistently running a trade surplus of uh, 10%, then this would be B would be equal to 0.9. If it was consistently running a trade deficit of 10%, it would be equal to 1.1. And uh, if we have a balanced budget rule, then it's just one. Um, tax, re tax revenue are seen as the effective rate of uh, overall tax on all forms of, on national income and a really simple net export functions made of autonomous net exports and national income um, times by some responsiveness parameter. Okay, we solve as usual, nothing too crazy here. Um, and we're just simplifying by saying that all the autonomous components of demand can be expressed into EA. And we have the multiplier down here. Um, this M part, we won't be changing, so we can just simplify it. We will be changing tax rates, so we'll leave that out. So this is a, a, a very common, uh, yeah, a fairly sort of textbook model so far. And we're assuming Keynes instability at all times, and we're holding, holding these past two times constant throughout the analysis. Okay, taking this, uh, oh yeah, now we have to move into period two and try to understand what changes when foreign affiliates establish themselves. Well, we have to add the net income receipts, any investments, uh, real investments or tangible investment or gross fixed capital formation um, undertaken by foreign firms. And we need to consider the net exports of foreign firms. We can relate the net exports of foreign firms uh, to the profits, well, the income statement of those foreign affiliates. So the gross profits of foreign affiliates is equal to the revenue uh, from, foreign, uh, from foreign sales, so their exports, the revenue gen generated domestically, the imports of those foreign affiliates, the material costs sourced domestically and the wage um, bill of the foreign firms. Um, without losing too much generality, we can safely assume that they export all their outputs and that they import all their costs. Uh, in uh, material costs. Therefore, the net exports to this basic income statement we can relate directly to the value added in terms of profits and wages. Um, a second thing we'll assume is that the net income receipts, uh, well, the net income payments are uh, consi consist purely of the net profits of the foreign affiliates. So after they have been taxed, the profits leave the economy. Uh, they are repatriated as. The investment of foreign firms, we'll say, is completely financed by uh, the foreign parents. Um, so we don't have to consider additional uh, income flows to volunteers and so on. And uh, we note that the, the tax collected on foreign affiliates are, is immediately reinjected into the economy, times by the public um, uh, finance parameter. Okay, now we find uh, in a similar fashion the equilibrium. Uh, income level in the second period. And with this, then we can see if uh, the second period income level is higher, we can kind of try to at least have this intuitive understanding in a simple model of whether it has grown and under what conditions. This is the general form. And of course, uh, we need to talk about how uh, these, these demand injections come to be. Um, generally, before we consider the commercialization of state sovereignty, we just assume that the tax rates are equal across the two periods. Uh, what can we say generally about the possibility of FDI-like growth in this framework? Well, we can express uh, the income level in the second period in these terms. 
um, where the additional income is generated by those foreign affiliates via the um, part of net exports, which is equal to the wage bill, the, um, well, the, the additional government revenue, uh, government spending based on the additional government revenue, and we also have the investment channel multiplied by the multiplier. Now, interestingly, I think Singer, even though he was extremely pessimistic, well, he was, uh, yeah, he very much questioned the possibility of FDI-led growth, even though he didn't call it FDI-led growth, he did uh, say that there is a possibility for FDI-led growth. Uh, he said it depends on some method of income absorption. Um, and he gave three ways in which this might occur. The first was the reinvestment of profits in the undeveloped countries themselves. Or we can represent that with our IF figure, the uh, investment uh, value. The absorption of profits by fiscal measures and the utilization for the finance of economic developments. Well, here we can see that's kind of included in our model in this way. And lastly, he gave one final way in which this could occur, this FDI approach, namely the absorption of rising productivity in primary production in rising real wages and other real incomes. Okay, we have that to some extent in our model too. So um, just before we even speak about CSS, we can see that there is um, this kind of broad notion of a possibility of some kind of FDI-led growth regime. First though, um, let's, let's consider a variant of the second period and which we'll call a traditional tax haven. Um, now, let's suppose that the uh, effective tax rate on all income in the second period is lower than the first period. Um, and so it's trying to uh, basically establish itself, this economy, as a, as a tax haven, um, like in the Caribbean, uh, marked by low or no income taxes overall. Um, well, if we further suppose that this uh, second period tax rate is low enough to induce multinationals to set up shell companies or special purpose entities in the newly established haven to facilitate pure profit shifting. So basically, the tax rate is low enough to catch the attention of um, multinationals. So no value added takes place in the haven. Um, it's pure profit shifting. The legal and accounting costs are negligible for now. We can talk about that in discussion if you like. Uh, and relative to the profits shifted inwards, um, they are completely negligible. So therefore, there's no wage cost. We can just say that the net exports is purely equal to the profits shifted. Um, and this kind of relates to the empirics that we were discussing earlier with relation to Ireland and these other tax havens. Um, and so we now have an expression for the second period income. And we have a growth condition, which says that it is possible for this economy to grow if the profits shifted inwards are large enough. And essentially, what we see here is that uh, it, it depends on the, the public finance parameter and the marginal propensity to consume. And it depends on how different, how much of a change there is between the two effective rates of tax in the two periods. For an, as, a, as an example, um, with this setup, with the tax rate in the first period of 40% and the second period of 5%, marginal propensity to assume of 0.7 and so on, then the uh, sh profits shifted inwards would have to be more than twice the size of the entire economy in, in, in terms of gross national income. So what we can say here is, if any, then only the smallest economies may successfully employ this CSS strategy. Um, and we'll come back to this very shortly. We can also consider a corporate tax haven, which is a variance, which is to say, well, in the previous model, uh, you have this overall effect of tax rates, but this is a bit of a blunderbuss. Why not just target corporate tax rates in particular, or more effectively yet, effect, uh, only change the effective tax rates on foreign, foreign corporate corporations? And essentially, you could say that this is what some countries try to achieve by filling their special economic zones with foreign firms exclusively. Alternatively, this industrialization by invitation approach, where you use state agencies like the Industrial Development Agency in Ireland or Czech Invest, we see that these agencies essentially target particular foreign firms and say, what do we need to do in order for you to establish yourself here? Um, and that, that therefore means that we can have a tax rate, overall tax rate, which stays the same, but the tax rate relevant to foreign multinational can be much, much lower. And in that case, there's an unambiguous growth outcome. Um, when you have this really targeted approach. We can discuss how realistic this is later. Um, but at least in theory, it would be quite straightforward. Okay, I, I realize I'm running a little bit short on time, but um, I'll just briefly summarize the last variance. 
essentially we have um, a model in which it's no longer the tax revenue channel that is um, that is most active, but you have the um, investments and um, wages channel, basically the employment channel, foreign affiliates, which may drive the economy. And to illustrate this, you could assume that they, uh, the, the state competes so uh, to such a, an extent that you actually have a effect, uh, negative effective rate of foreign corporation tax because the subsidies are much higher than um, the tax revenue collected. And you can show that there is also a growth uh, condition possibility here. Okay, just to finish up, um, we could use we can use this approach to try to categorize the different kinds of um, commercialized state growth models by understanding uh, the sort of nexus between export led and FDI led using similar to conditions, um, and this is what we have here. Um, so you can imagine an export-led uh, economy based purely on the performance of domestically owned firms. We could then imagine an FDI export-led economy that has nothing to do with commercialized states. So essentially it's the, um, the foreign firms that are seeking something like natural resources that the state has no control over and cannot produce. We could also imagine that there's an FDI-led economy that's not export-led such that uh, you have foreign firms that are seeking market access um, because let's say, uh, tariffs are extremely high and historically this seemed to occur quite frequently. And now we have what I would say is where Bolin Reagan's conception of FDI-led growth is. It's right in the middle. These commercialized states which try to induce FDI inflows and establish themselves as export platforms by providing the least cost costly um, business environment to these foreign multinationals. And then we have uh, tax havens, which seem export-led, but I, well, it depends. It really depends whether or not, and it's a, um, it depends on the particular economy, whether or not they are truly export-led or if they're actually fueled by the government revenue channel uh, and other channels that we could describe. Uh, and then of course, uh, let it not be forgotten that there'll be, there may be many commercialized states which simply fail to um, catalyze um, increasingly, that is the case, especially with special economic zones as a first mover advantage. Um, and essentially, we can, uh, I'll finish on this, we can briefly um, consider the, uh, how to categorize these different kinds of uh, commercialized states. Firstly, tax havens, but from our very simple model, they should have, um, well, we can say that they are recipients of shifted profits. And uh, the more likely traditional tax havens will have a much higher uh, shifted inward profit uh, to GDP ratio than uh, corporate tax havens, which may be targeted, uh, targeting uh, foreign corporations much more um, in, in a much more fine-tuned manner. And we see that yeah, the, the value of profit, profit shifted inwards can be quite substantial. The value of net exports due to foreign firms can be also quite substantial. Um, and of course, this might represent the same thing we have to keep in mind. Their average effective corporate tax rates on foreign affiliates tend to be extremely low, especially in the traditional havens. But uh, we could also see in Ireland for 3% and so on. Uh, and interestingly, we can see that this bears fruits, that this notion that they actually do collect a lot more corporation tax uh, seems to be the case because so much of their, foreign, uh, so much of their corporation tax is paid by foreign firms. In the case of Ireland, 65% of uh, corporation tax revenues are paid by foreign firms and it's quite high elsewhere too. Um, we could do the same thing for export platforms, but just generally just to compare non-Caribbean tax havens, export platforms and other net exporters. Uh, generally we find, well, of course, profit shifted inwards and tax havens is quite high. The net exports of foreign firms account for a large fraction of, um, of net exports in tax havens and export platforms. Um, this, this category down here you can kind of see as perhaps something like a traditional export-led conception. Um, and again, we can see differences in the effective rate of corporation tax and total tax revenue collected. Um, I, I know I'm pressing up against time, so I'll, I'll finish there and um, we could perhaps discuss any problems of this approach or the, the, the implications of, of this approach for um, yeah, other growth models and for the growth models themselves in the discussion if you like. 
apologies for going over time and looking forward to the discussion. <laughs>